This is Jim Soper with Ballots for Bernie. I am talking live with Jan Bendor from the Michigan Election Reform Association. Uh, Alliance. Alliance, sorry. We are going to be talking about the recounts in Michigan and with some time also about the history of recounts in Michigan and around the country. But we're going to start with Michigan because it is in the news and it's, it's become an important topic. Uh, Jen, just give us very briefly uh, uh, one minute of history of what Mira is about and what your connection is with them. And then we're going to start into talking about elections in Michigan. Sure. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, the Michigan Election Reform Alliance uh, actually incorporated in 2006, but we started in 2004 after the debacle of the Ohio presidential election, when many of our people had gone to Ohio to volunteer in what they thought would be a recount there. And they came back pretty fired up to uh, look into what was going wrong at home. Uh, at that time, I was deputy clerk of a large urban township I'd been an accredited election administrator for 16 years, and I had been through the disaster, disaster of 2000 uh, and seen the nightmare of the HAVA money going uh, to uh, horrible machines that we didn't want. So uh, we were pretty aware of election integrity issues at that point. We formed the Michigan Election Reform Alliance. We put together a, a legislative reform plan and since that time, we have been doggedly working our plan, which includes post-election audits, uh, risk-limiting statistical audits. We have been working on just a whole list of reforms that everything from voting rights to constitutional rights, uh, we've branched out into working on redistricting. So we have a pretty broad, pretty broad number of election-related purposes. Okay. Um, you've been at it a long time and covering a, a lot of territory. Let's start with more recent Michigan history. You're telling me about elections in Detroit. What went on there? Well, we, uh, we had a, a horror take place in this state with the election of uh, Governor Rick Snyder, who is uh, one of the worst governors in the country. He was part of the 2010 takeover and uh, he immediately passed, uh, within two months of his taking office, an emergency manager act, which allowed the state to go and just literally take over cities and school districts that they decided were not up to snuff economically. Uh, well, 2010, as you know, was two years into the, the depression. C cities all over the state were having problems. But Detroit was not in any way in serious trouble. The main problem they had was uh, was a pension underfunding, and um, uh, but you know, it's pretty soon African American cities were falling like flies, and what that meant was that the citizens had no right to vote for their local uh, office holders. They could elect them, but then the office holders had absolutely no power. So we knew our democracy was in trouble, and. Uh, so leading up to 2013, which was a mayoral in, election in Detroit, right before the city was due to go through a bankruptcy trial, which it never deserved or needed. And um, we suspected that Hanky Panky was already in place. Uh, a man who was not even a resident of Detroit, who was white, uh, running for mayor in an 84% African-American city that already seems a little sketchy, it was. And he was from um, a community right outside Detroit called Livonia, which is all Republican. And you have Detroit, an all, all Democratic city. Uh, that election was uh, one fraud after another. We trained challengers. We had witnesses. We documented the fraud. We could get no, uh, no law enforcement to do anything. We went through a recount uh, time and time again. We were denied at the recount. The people who did this were primarily the candidates who were the legitimate candidates. Uh, so we were already on alert that anything that was going to happen after 2013 was going to be a nightmare. And not to pick on Detroit, we had three other cities with similar issues of uh, corruption, 
uh, because of corporate takeovers of these cities, not because of the residents. <laughs> Uh, the media love to blame black people. Um, and so coming into the primary season this year, uh, we were braced for the worst. Um, and there were a number of other predictors. We knew from Mira's own research that our 14-year-old tabulators were all dilapidated and falling apart. And we actually published a report in January of 2014 that said facing Michigan's election cliff, the, the high, the steep costs of failing tabulators. And what we had was exactly what we predicted two years ago. Massive tabulator failures. This means long lines. You've got to, you've got to fix it or you've got to replace it while people are standing there. Uh, not, this is no way to run a pop stand. And we had tried and tried to get a bill through that would have put in place a process for a blue ribbon commission to get, just like Colorado did, they studied all the different ways they could count their votes. What would be the best? the most trusted. Well, we wanted a two-year study here. And if that had been done, we wouldn't be where we were this year with a, a nightmare election. Uh, which were the cities that were also being affected uh, by the election problems? Besides Flint, the Pontiac, uh, out on the west side, uh, the uh, Allegan County, the cities in Allegan County, the cities in Berrien County, uh, these cities had uh, clusters of migrant people, uh, African Americans, uh, all of them losing their rights, and it's still it's still pretty much the, that that way. The emergency managers are limited to two years. Most of them left the cities in worse shape than when they took them over. So they're focusing on minority communities. Absolutely, they picked on them because. When you look at these these older cities, there are many things of value in these cities. They have infrastructure, they have water. Uh, water is a commodity, as you know. Uh, they have lighting systems, they have, they have uh, land. Uh, Flint has uh, land uh, that's slated for fracking. So the idea was the corporations would take over these cities, drive the people out, literally drive the people out. Detroit has lost a quarter of a million people. And I can tell you where they are. A lot of them are, are, are sleeping on the beach in Santa Monica right now. I've run into them. I've run into them in Eureka. Um, and, and people have nowhere to go. It's an internal U.S. migration crisis that nobody's talking about. And they could have been voting in Michigan if they, they hadn't pushed up. They would have been voting in Michigan up until, uh, you know, 2010. Uh, Detroit was a reliable, democratic stronghold. Okay, Jen, give us a website where people can go to get this information. Have well, our reports are published uh, at the Michigan Election Reform Alliance.org website. We also have manuals. Uh, people can see how we've done our own post election audits using photography. Uh, we've actually calculated the error rate of the tabulators from this study. We have one study called Are Michigan's Elections Trustworthy? And we answer that question, uh, not. Um, so uh, we have, we've tried to share what we've learned. We, we have a lot of uh, kits there. Uh, we have all of our legislation and our proposals is there and, uh, and our, our legislative plan. So you can see what we've done. This is michiganelectionreform.org, you said? michiganelectionreformalliance.org. Okay. .org. All one word. <laughs> All one word. Um, okay, let's go into November now. We've already getting the picture that things are fairly corrupt in Michigan, something similar, not exactly the same history, but a background similar to Wisconsin. And let's get into November. Did you see already in the run up this fall to the election things happening to shift the election? Uh, we didn't see any signs of, of drastic shifting. I, I don't think anybody was looking for what would, of course, eventually explain all that. I don't think most uh, most white people in the Midwest or in or even in Michigan were aware of the population drain that's taken place in the state uh, and how it was concentrated in certain places. 
so, you know, Michael Moore predicted um, that that uh, Trump would win, and no one else uh, did, and no one else believed him. But Michael Moore lives in Flint. He knew exactly what's been going on. Flint has had a terrible population loss. Over half of the people in Flint have, have gone. That is first... Uh, film was about Flint, basically. That's right. And the, the attack on the people of Flint. Okay, so we get to election day, and Mr. Trump is the nominal winner there, and you started to see results. What was raising red flags? The the red flags immediately had to do with the number of provisional ballots that voters uh, were being given. The emphasis in this state has always been on avoiding provisional ballots. They're a joke. Uh, they were forced on us by the, the Federal Help America Vote Act, but they're pretty meaningless. And uh, clerks in this state, and by the way, we, we have a unique election system. Our elections are controlled by local clerks, city and township clerks. There are 1,500 of them. And uh, as such, uh, these people are very, very proud of their work. They're very independent. And uh, they, uh, they try to get voters to where they need to be and uh, they, to, to cast a regular ballot. So provisional ballots are just definitely uh, not a thing here. And when you see large numbers of provisional ballots, then you know there's something really wrong. Somebody has been messing with voter registrations. And I started hearing from friends in Detroit of uh, many people being turned away on election day. I was getting, my phone was ringing off the hook. People who'd been registered for years, all of a sudden, they're not. Uh, something very crazy was going on. And we're actually still investigating that because the recount provided absolutely no insight into that problem at all. Um, we've, we've had to clash with our Secretary of State before. One of our reports on our website is, um, uh, about the Michigan uh, purge that uh, was an attempted voter purge. Uh, we caught our Secretary of State carrying out what was, uh, we documented a Carl Rove request. You know, Rove was trying to uh, clear out all of the battleground states for the 2008 election. And they were going to purge a million voters. <laughs> now that's illegal in Michigan. The only person who can cancel a voter is that local clerk. That city or township clerk, no one else yeah. is is a uh, is is a legal person. So um, for that to take place at the state level is completely illegal under state law, and uh, we stopped them. Uh, we got the help. I have to give a lot of credit to the Advancement Project in Washington. They're fierce fighters. They've got lawyers. Uh, we had to go and get Uncle Vinny to help us, and they did. And the state backed down, and they will not. Um, you know, they will not admit to doing any purging now because they were caught at it. So we're very curious as, about how did all those voters get removed from the voting list? This is uh, very interesting. And I think, again, we're going to look to Car Carl Rove because he was the master in this whole thing. How many voters are we talking about with the provisionals? Well, we're, we're not aware of the numbers yet because the state doesn't publish them. Uh, it's public information, but they keep it very cleverly hidden. I've got a whole bunch of volunteers uh, that are starting to work on that now to collect those reports. But we, we, we expect to find a very high number. Would this be connected to interstate cross-check? Yes. Uh, Ray Powell yes. was reporting on in his fabulous film, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. Is that well, we, we confronted the state about that. We've confronted them for the last three years, well before Palast was writing about this. We knew about cross-check. And in every time we have inquired if they're using it, they swear they are only using it to dedupe driver licenses with other states. Yeah, but they weren't. Um, so, so. We, we're finding out about that. But at any rate, that's one of the things that went wrong. Uh, we... we we have, uh, you know, the expectation that a lot of other things are going to go wrong because the machines are were expected to break down. We also expected that there would be uh, a whole lot of just administrative problems. Uh, elections have become incredibly complicated, way more than normal humans can do, thanks to 
the stupidity of electronic vote counting. And so there's so many places where you can make mistakes. Uh, we've had a, a massive retirement of our experienced election staff. Uh, you know, every, in a general election for every precinct, you really have to have at least 12 to 14 people per precinct to, to administer a proper election. And when your knowledgeable people have, have quit, they've, they're, they've retired, they've burned out, uh, then you have uh, a, a real hole. And people just, you know, they're not going to remember all these details. Uh, as an election administrator, the way I handled that was I gave people uh, a step-by-step -step checklist from the time they arrived at six in the morning to the time they left, which could be two in the morning, three in the morning, uh, everything they had to do. And, and they were expected to just go down that checklist. They didn't have to think, just do this, do this, do this. And it worked very well because then people didn't have to remember stuff. Uh, there would be one or two people who would kind of have the overview. Um, and we managed to have you know, very well uh, organized and orderly elections. And at the end of the night, all of our numbers would ba balance. The number of people showing up to vote and the number of ballots counted would match. That's a key thing. Um, and a lot of other, uh, uh, you know, auditing type things that you do to make to make a credible election. So mm -hmm. by the end of the night, you should have all that stuff right. Well, if you don't get it right, you've got another layer of protection, which is called a receiving board. And these people... Uh, our, our intent on getting uh, any mistakes caught that were made by the first group. Uh, that all goes then to the, the county uh, clerk and the county board of canvassers. And the day after the election, they go through all the precincts in the county and try to make sure that everybody didn't make mistakes. If someone does, they're brought in uh, to, to fix it. The canvassers aren't going to fix it. So by the end of this whole sequence, you should have a pretty good quality control over your election. Well, this recount show that's not happening. That's absolutely not happening. And uh, when, when you've got uh, half of the precincts in, in the entire city of Detroit that are a, a, a hot mess, an ungodly mess, with missing ballots, missing numbers, numbers not balancing, uh, you know, even if you assume that everybody had good intentions, which I don't, uh, you you have uh, this is not a credible election. Uh, this is not democracy when you've got an election that's a, a, in disarray like this, um, and that's what we saw. Uh, now we also think that there was hanky panky going on, uh, but we're in the process of trying to prove it. It's very difficult. We we could not get the information out of the recount that really gave us the help we needed to see what was going on. The, the biggest thing that we, we saw, and, and, and you've probably seen this mentioned, is the number of uh, ballots that had no vote for president. Uh, most people, you know, go to vote for president. If they vote for anybody else, it's, it's great, but that's what they're there for. You don't expect to see very many ballots with president blank. This election, the state of Michigan had 75,000, by the state's own number, 75,000 ballots that had no vote for president. Uh, Trump won by a little over 10,000. And so you have to ask, well, what's going on there? This is really not normal. And immediately, that's a suspicious condition. You have to look at, uh, were, uh, were there funny things going on with the programming of the memory cards that run the counting inside a tabulator? That would be very easy to do in the state because out of 83 counties, 80 of them use a private tech company allied with one of the three voting tabulator manufacturers. And these tech companies are not sworn officials and they program how the ballots are going, how the votes are going to be counted. And I'm, I, yeah. Stop you there, because I've heard of this in, in other states. You're talking about a tech company that is not one of the major system vendors and is not your public election officials, but some other company on the side that we- They're really affiliated with, with the big vendors. In other words, the big vendors subcontract the, the programming. Um, what do they my, do? Ca my county programs their own. They don't trust these guys. I mean, you know, we have some counties that have some, some real ethical 
positions. There are three counties that program their own memory cards, but others don't bother, or they don't have the you know they don't have the staff. And so we're we're actually our 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 elections have been outsourced to these private contractors. This is something that John Brakey's been digging up in Arizona, and I want to clarify for our our viewers here when when we're talking about programming memory cards. The each voting machine or each scanner has to know what the ballot is that they're scanning or that the people are voting with. It becomes what's called a ballot definition file. And that file lists who the candidates are in which races for that machine. And that's called programming the, the ballot card. And right. that's what these <clears throat> private companies about which we know almost nothing. Right. And they're not sworn. They're not sworn to uphold the Constitution or the laws. They, they, there's no accountability for these people. Uh, they'll play the, claim they have fiscal responsibility to their owners, and that's it. No um, consequences for them. No consequences. So they're sending this information out, and viewers want to uh, search for the phrase fraction magic. They will get an idea of what kind of subversive power these people, unseen power these people have. That's right. And, being able to fiddle with the vote counts on these machines from one central place, from a, a private little job shop that nobody knows anything about. The other thing that's that's striking me here, you said you had how many townships and so on running this election in Michigan? Well, we have about 1,500 local units that are running elections. Um, now, that's a strength. That is a strength because if you were going to, to rig an election centrally, it would be almost impossible. But it's not as strong as it should be because you've got a lot of them using these same private contractors. That's the breakdown. That is the essential breakdown. And there's no, there's no oversight. Nobody is checking what code they're putting in. Nobody. We have in California 58 counties that run the show here. When you're, we already talked about 58 county chaos in California, and you're talking about 1500 township chaos, and that's just mind boggling. It's not and chaotic. I, I, I have a lot of respect for the people who do run these local elections, they are very uh, patriotic for the most part. These are the little blue haired ladies that we trust our elections to. They don't know how they've been undermined. They have no clue how their efforts at running honest elections have been sabotaged by this corporate election system, which we are now we've been stuck with since since uh, Bob Nay and the Help America Vote Act. Well, when we're talking about fifty-eight county chaos here, is because we have fifty-eight rule books in California. So I can go 10 miles north into the next county and expect to see the election conducted the same way. They're using different machines. They, they do it differently. And even if you go across San Francisco Bay, they're using the same machine from Sequoia and they do it differently. So it's chaotic. And in June, when I, people asked me to say, how do we observe stuff? I had to say, point first of all, to find your county rule book, county procedures and how to do it start there because I couldn't tell them. I don't know how they do it in 58 counties. John Brakey reports that from Arizona, they have one rule book for the whole state. Arizona, Arizona is a small state, but it's something that we need to be working for is to consolidate the rules so that people, um, observers can know they can go from one county to the next and hopefully later to, from one state to the next to know what to expect and, and know what the rules are. And this is part of the problem that is coming out in spades as we are looking at Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Nevada, and they all have different rule books and different systems, and we're trying to recount them. And it's, again, chaos. Jimmy Carter will not observe elections in the United States because he doesn't know what the rules are. Well, he says we we lack any kind of uh, rational system. You know, we don't meet the the criteria of the Carter Center. Yeah. So no, we can't do this. Okay, let's go back to the fun stuff, <laughs> the election and the recount. 
Um, what did you see coming out of Detroit? What was raising red flags in Detroit now? Aside from a lot of provisionals, but what else? There was significant things happening there. Well, uh, uh, hearing from people who had been to the polls, uh, who were uh, shocked at how disorganized the precincts were. Um, and, you know, just like uh, precincts all over this state, uh, for, for many years, we had longtime election workers. They were very competent. They were very well organized. And all of a sudden, it was just a, a, a mess. You had new people who didn't know what they were doing. You didn't even have a precinct chair who was very knowledgeable. Uh, it was it was a, a, a very shocking situation for a lot of uh, longtime voters who who expected to go into their precinct and see an orderly situation. And it was made even worse with the tabulators breaking down, uh, which was, as I've said, a predicted uh, phenomenon. It could have been prevented had the state taken uh, proactive measures and nothing happened uh, on that level. So this this was this was a slow motion wreck and what the the aborted recount did we actually the recount got about halfway through the ballots in a lot of areas but it showed us that we 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 were in a slow motion train wreck. This whole election was a train wreck. And it grieves me greatly because you know in the in the 50s through about the 80s Michigan had a highly respected election system. It was counted in you know the top five in the country for uh, for transparency, accuracy, and honesty. Um, Jen, one one point of clarification: when you're talking about tabulators, I have in my head something that's sitting in the county headquarters, and not in the precincts. We're talking about voting machines, touchscreen machines, and scanners. What are you referring to when you're saying tabulators? Tabulators are the scanners. They are uh, optical scan tabulators. That's what they're called. Uh, uh, Diebold, ESNS, and Sequoia were the brands that Michigan bought in 2003 and 4. Um, it's a, another horror story about how that all went down. Uh, Diebold, of course, has uh, uh, changed its name uh, three times, and it's now... Uh, part of uh, Dominion Systems. Don't you like that name? Uh, Dominion is a, a company headquartered in Toronto. Uh, so that's one, uh, one outsource uh, all the way to uh, another country. Uh, Sequoia at one point was owned by the um, country of Venezuela. <laughs> uh, Sequoia got sold and eventually, uh, you know, things happened there. ESNS has continued as a company uh, they were trying to buy everybody up, but fortunately, uh, the Justice Department stopped them because they were creating a monopoly. Uh, the new machines aren't much different from the old ones. The old ones were 1970s uh, computer junk. Uh, they, the memory cards still only have about 256K. And when was the last time you heard of anything with that little amount of memory? Uh, about 20 years ago. Um, I did a report on a Dominion system that was submitted for review in California. You'll find it on my webpage, countedascast.org. Uh, look on the left side, and it was, the interface to that was the worst interface I have seen to computer systems since the 80s. So it was not uh, very impressive, but we don't need to, to stay yeah. there. Um, the, the programming is in basic, by the way. Huh? Basic computer basic. language. Basic, ba basic computer language. It's still in basic. Any sixth grader learned it's to do that. Language which violates federal regulations. <laughs> uh, and, and so they shouldn't be doing that. We went through that uh, 10 years ago. Well, and, we're still stuck with them. Yeah, well, wonderful. What brought about this shift? You said in Detroit there was a shift in how well the elections were being run. What brought that about? Well, uh, the, the election of uh, Janice Winfrey as city clerk, um, everybody had great hopes for her because she was uh, uh, supposedly, you know, going to bring 
more transparency and honesty to her office. Well, it turns out she was just uh, in the pocket of the corporate interests who uh, who intended uh, to uh, take over the city of Detroit, and they have. Uh, they have they have bought everything. They've privatized everything in the city. They've stolen the city's assets. They stole its magnificent water and sewer system, which was the single best system in the United States with uh, the best uh, urban you know, water you, you could ever get, taken from the pure water of Lake Huron, um, you know, one of the Great Lakes. Uh, and uh, the lighting system is gone. A beautiful Belle Isle Park, which is just a landmark. All of the city's assets have, have now been uh, privatized. And uh, this is a theft of billions of dollars from a municipality. And this is this is a, a, the theft of taxpayers' long-time investments. Well, That's why you cheat in elections. You cheat in elections because you want to steal things that are valuable. You're not going to cheat in a school board election where nobody even gets paid to go to the meetings. You're going to cheat when there are billions of dollars at stake. That's why Detroit was a target. When I was a child, uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, by the way, and when I was a child, Detroit was a jewel of the Midwest. And this is no longer true. Um, it, it, it still it still is in little places. There are little places that escaped the maw of the monster. Well, I hope to come out there and, and visit with you sometime. Let's go to, you, you mentioned that the Michigan election law was in, misinterpreted. Can you give us the standard interpretation and then what you think is the correct interpretation? Well, since 2000, um, actually, since 2002, with the advent of Terry Lynn Land as Secretary of State, Terry Lynn Land is from the west side of Michigan and part of the Richard DeVos uh, wing of the f far right of the Republican Party. Uh, and uh, you may have heard of uh, DeVos's wife, Betsy, who has been nominated to be Secretary of Education. Uh, oh. So Richard DeVos is like a mini Koch brother. Uh, he get, his dad made the money from Amway. And uh, so since 2002, we have had a far right wing secretary of state uh, and they decided uh, to weaken the election system so they could control Michigan more directly. We had two pillars of honesty and integrity in our election system that it was brilliantly designed in the 50s by people who, who knew something. Uh, at the front end of every election, we had an election commission that was responsible for making sure that however you voted, that device was uh, in good repair, in good working order, it was trustworthy, it had been tested. They also were to supply the ballots to make sure the ballots were all correct and proofread. They were to supply all the other supplies like seals to seal up things securely. So that was at the front end of the process. And then at the back end of the process were the boards of canvassers. And they were the last bastion of security for elections. The board of canvassers was two Republican appointees and two Democratic appointees. And their job was to make sure that at the end of the election, everything had been done correctly and honestly. And if there were problems, uh, they would independently hold uh, recounts to make sure that everybody was satisfied that the election was honest and correct. Well, uh, they had police power. When you petitioned for a recount, it said right on the petition, mistake or fraud. The reason for my petition is mistake or fraud. So basically you were making a police report uh, and no candidate ask for a recount unless they suspect something weird because the election came out differently than what they really expected. And most candidates pretty well know how their election's gonna come out. So uh, as a result of that, the law provided that a, a board of canvassers had police power. They could subpoena witnesses. The recount uh, was to be documented by a court reporter. Any challenges were to be part of the record. You could swear in and subpoena witnesses. Um, you could hire investigators and experts. And at the end of this, if there was evidence, you would turn that over to the county prosecutor because a crime had occurred. And that's even in the mistake category. Uh, mistakes happen uh, 
often when people are not upholding their duty. So that's neglect, that's malfeasance. So um, it was a very strict standard uh, and, and, and that was a good thing. Uh, starting in 2002, the boards of canvassers were, were told, oh, don't bother your pretty little heads about that part. We're just here to, to count the paper. In fact, what the other part of the law says is that the recount is supposed to examine everything. Uh, the mem you know, memory cards, the ballot boxes, uh, uh, the blank ballots that are left over, you know, the, are there supposed to be more than that? What happened to the rest of the blank ballots? Everything is part of the investigation, not just the ballots counting what's on the paper. That was only part of the recount. But, but the secretaries of state convinced people and, and, you know, they, they, they talk in very officious tones and the press buys whatever they say that the law didn't say what it said. So we get to 2016 and um, Jill Stein files for a statewide recount and her lawyers are told, well, you can only recount precincts where everything is perfect, where the seal is still there and the number on the seal matches the poll book and all this other nitpicky stuff, that is not what the law says. The law says you're supposed to recount everything. And if there's a broken seal or uh, numbers that are uh, discrepant, you're supposed to investigate and find out why, because maybe somebody should go to prison. And all of this has just been a total fiasco. Um, it's a lie that there was a recount in this state. It was not a recount according to Michigan election law. And I've, I've vetted, you know, it isn't just my interpretation. The law is very plain. You can read it yourself and you'll say, yeah, that's what that means. But I've run this by a lot of attorneys and they've all said, you know, nobody's ever read this. That is what it says. And I was part of a recount in 2000 before the takeover where we, we did go through everything and determined why certain things, you know, were sort of slightly off and ultimately um, counted every single ballot, no matter what container it had been in. There were even ballots that were counted that had been uh, overlooked on election night because somebody forgot them in the back of a clerk's car. You know, they were absentee ballots that got forgotten. And as long as the investigation showed they had not been compromised. No one had had access to them. They had been in a vault. They were counted too. And in a congressional recount uh, where the difference was a hundred votes, which is very close, um, those all of the ballots were counted. And and I was there, I saw it. And it was the way it was, should, should have been done. So you were saying that the law never was changed from its original- Never been changed, it's still there. It's just been ignored purposefully to distort the process. Do you have any idea, because you're saying that Jill Stein's lawyers have been to use one word, hornswoggled in accepting this. Do you have any idea how they pulled that off or what's going on? Well, I can tell you that the Stein uh, campaign hired the wrong lawyer. Um, I won't go into that, but the lawyer they hired has a terrible record. Uh, I actually got uh, given, I had a tiny opportunity to make a recommendation, which I did, and my recommendation was ignored. Um, and they hired a, the wrong legal team. Had they hired a, a better legal team, that team would have told them, don't get schnuckered. You know, don't, don't spend money on a worthless recount. Insist my on the real thing. My, I just gave money to recountnow.org. I gave it today because seeing what's going on in the background, I'm seeing who was sending in the real longtime knowledgeable uh, election advocates like you, like John Brakey, uh, like some people who I won't main, main yet into Nevada. And these are the people who, who have an idea of what's really going on. And I don't want to say that Jill Stein isn't doing the right thing in Michigan. Looks like they may have fumbled the ball. Um, in, for recount now, I know they're sending in very good people. So I just gave them a, a what for me is a largest donation, recountnow.org. Uh, the recounts are sort of over, but this is a good place to send some money because this is, 
really what we need now. Um, but but don't but don't engage in a recount unless the rules are going to produce a real recount. And that means, in addition, an investigation of suspicious things. If oh, yeah. there are a, a lot of blank ballots coming in from absentee voters, there's something wrong there. I personally observed at the recount site in Detroit, precinct after precinct, where there were blank absentee votes. Well, absentee voters aren't going to spend 68 cents to send in a blank ballot. Nobody does that. In 16 years, I've never seen that. Something very bizarre is going on. There are all kinds of sus suspicious things that we've seen uh, that are really unprecedented. And th this was not a recount. This was a, a, a crime. It, it smells like it. I, and, and the part of the, I, I, perhaps not the word, I'm, I'm using stonewalling. The stonewalling is that we can't go find out. We can't dig into it. Uh, that by itself smells. Um, was there other evidence in, in, in some of the precincts and some of the recount activity of, of, of people trying to cover up or to stonewall what was going on there, the stonewalling actions? Well, by, by insisting that many precincts could not be recounted because there were you know, a discrepancy of one ballot between what was physically uh, stacked and, and what had been put in the poll book, that's stonewalling. That's a cover-up. When, when you will not let a recount go forward under normal, you know, normal conditions of a slight error, uh, and, you, and you, all you have to do is investigate, and you can see that at one in the morning, these people were tired and they made an arithmetic mistake. It happens in a lot of places. So uh, that's a stone wall. It was a stone wall when they would not let the observers count the, the ballots that were stacked in the other category. The way that the counting went, there was a stack for Trump, there was a stack for Clinton, there was a stack for Stein, there were stacks for two other uh, party candidates. And then they had a stack for other. And that's where they lumped in those undervoted ballots, the blank ballots, which were also counted as undervotes. You had write-in ballots, you had overvoted ballots, all in one big stack. And in some places, they didn't even bother to count that stack. So now how are you gonna reconcile the, the, the count you've just done of the, the other five if that six stack is never reported? I, all kinds of shenanigans like that. That's you know that, that's basic accounting 101. You count everything. You should count everything. I'm going to include in here a colleague that you met this past week, uh, Richard Chan. Can you shift over here, Richard? Hey, Richard. Hi, Jan. And Richard is a member of the Voting Rights Task Force here in California. And he and another member went out to Michigan to look at the recount. Uh, I'm, and he's sitting right next to me. Um, Richard, what did you see out there? What, what took you notice? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> my second day there, we, we dealt with one uh, two bag uh, entity that had five precincts in it and only two of the five were counted because the other three were off by one or two votes, uh, which to me is absurd. I mean, the ones you want to count most are the ones where you find a discrepancy. You know, you don't want to find the ones that perfectly match the count. Well, you want to count them too, but you don't want to per purposely leave out any ones that may be off. That's that's nuts, you know? I couldn't believe that. Um, what about, the, um, there's an official who saw something? Or, or, or? Oh, there was a lady we bumped into who uh, who said that she's, I don't know if you want this on the, on the internet yet. Uh, uh, 
that's not we, we probably yeah. shouldn't go into this richard because right. you know we we haven't had a chance to really right. delve into it right. Uh, right but but you you have someone identified who possibly witnessed a very serious crime yeah. during the recount during the recount <laughs> Let's leave it at that. You're right. Let's leave it at that. It just it caught right. my attention as something um, that we're going to need to pursue. Right. I I'm just I just want to back up everything Jan's been saying because uh, uh, it's a it was a facade recount. It was uh, it had all the appearances of a recount that. Uh, in name only, I would say, you know, uh, because so much was not counted. They wouldn't let us look at the books where the names were. They wouldn't let us look in the back of the book to see the seal numbers, to see if they were changed. Uh, they wouldn't let us look at the tape, the tabulator tape for the numbers. It was all, all, the, all those parts of it were trust us, you know, and even the great sage Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify, you know? And so it was uh, it was a Potemkin village of recounts. Well know? said, well said. Yeah, well said. Okay. Jan, let, let, let's go back here. First of all, um, we are trying to take a look at comments. You can leave comments. And if we have some questions for Jan, we'll try to get them in. Um, you talked to me earlier, by the way, also somebody also noted that this undervoting the blank ballots is not just an issue in Michigan, but was basically across much of the, much of the country. It's, it's one of the big questions we have. Why were people voting but not voting? And I will bring up uh, an issue that's started becoming more clear uh, to me this summer, something that Bev Harris said mentioned some things 10 years ago again going back to these private shops that are helping the election officials and uh, there are people with dubious past that are working on vote vote by mail projects would they help the county to send out ballots and what what became clear is that the these operations can get the names, the address, um, birthdays, and signatures. And they're getting blank ballots, they're getting blank envelopes, and saying, here, please send out the vote by mail ballots. And this sets an opportunity up for uh, what I call signature, uh, no, what's the, automated forgery, where they could print up the envelopes, because they have the signatures. They can print up the, the envelopes and then they can connect that with the fact that parties are now running vote by mail operations or get out the vote operations. And people call up and say, oh, are you, have you voted today? And if the person says, no, I'm not going to vote, then they know who they can go vote for and send in a ballot for them. Because remember, they had everything they need, including the signatures, to get onto that ballot. And this, we had a bill in, in California, maybe 1921, where this year got passed by the legislature, signed by the government governor, which would allow anybody to bring in literally a truckload of vote by mail ballots drop them off at the election office and say, here, count them. That's where I started to... Without a, giving a name or... There's no any, there's no information no about information. who's delivering. Right. This is just wide open voter coercion, vote fraud, voter fraud, and, and vote buying. Um, and this is going to be an issue we're going to have to look in more closely, especially people who are working at the local level, finding out who is helping the counties, who's getting paid for by the counties to, to run their operations. And it could be legit, but Brakey had to put some election officials on the stand in order to get the information out there on the witness stand in order to find out who's doing this. And they were sort of denying it first. And uh, 
there there's there's a whole secretive network out there that we don't need to know about. We need to find out about. Um, Bev Harris has always been right to distrust uh, vote by mail and absentee voting in, uh, in most places because of the utter lack of controls. And I respect Bev for, for beating that drum for years. Um, the one thing I can say is that in Michigan, uh, we've had a pretty watertight system. We don't have vote by mail. You have to apply for an absentee ballot every election. There is no automatic anything, and you have to have a signature match. And we have some very good signature matchers um, who can who can tell the difference, uh, uh, even between a father and son with the same name living at the same address when they got their ballots switched and sent them in each other's envelopes. Um, and and we, we check in at four different points. There are a lot of, of uh, controls. Uh, but we would never allow uh, ballots to be delivered by any third party. Uh, the ballot has to be delivered by the voter or by the U.S. mail. That's it. You cannot bring in a ballot for, for other people unless you're a sworn election official. Um, well, it's you know, changing this changing in California. They're going to, over the next four years, allow counties to opt into a system where the counties may send vote by mail ballots to anybody. That's terrible. That's a, you're going to lose control entirely. I know. Um, this is part of SB 450. You can read more about that again on my website, counterdiscuss.org. Thank you for for dogging that. Vote by mail is is ex existing uh, in Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and it's coming. We're already half of California. It's vote by mail. And it's going to be, they're going to get, everybody will, almost everybody will get vote by mail ballots, whether they ask for it or not. And, and the situation is just expanding and getting worse. Well, and, and how can that uh, work with the amount of mobility in our society? Uh, you know, we've got cities in this state, and, and I don't think we're nearly as mobile as a lot, uh, where there's a turnover of 20% of the population. Uh, young voters, uh, they're sleeping on a different couch every month. Uh, you send a, a ballot to them, it's never going to reach them, and someone else is going to get it. Uh, if That's a, just a terrible system. Well, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with it because it's it's growing in popularity, and uh, it, it's, it's a problem. Let's go back and do a, a little bit of history here. You said that you were... You got involved in this in 1980, and you were a township trustee, and then something happened. Could you run us through that? Yeah, I I, uh, I ran for re-election, and, and we had a very, very hot uh, primary election in a township that's uh, pretty heavily Democratic, and so the big action is in the primary. Um and we were starting to uh, fight over development and the destruction by development of our beautiful rural natural area. And so the primary was all about that conflict. Uh, I lost by five votes. Well, uh, late on election day, somebody found five uh, ballots with my name on it in a wastebasket at a polling place. Uh, so someone had just thrown away five votes. Um, I found out at that point as a, an innocent uh, do-gooder uh, that it was very easy for someone to cheat um, and get away with it. I could not get the state to send anyone down to investigate, uh, you know, depose witnesses, take a, a, the police, the state police were not prepared. They're not trained in elections. They know guns and they know traffic. Uh, and supposedly the state had four investigators that they could send and not a single one of them got there. Uh, two months later, I said, okay, I'm gonna find a lawyer and sue. Well, I couldn't find any attorneys that knew anything. And I realized at that point, uh, you know, we're on an honor system. And when somebody is dishonorable, there's no law enforcement and that has not changed. We have good laws, they're not enforced. Nobody wants to take responsibility for election laws being enforced. Um, a couple of years ago, Mira met with the state police. We said, you know, something's got to happen. We're not enforcing our election laws. 
And they said, look, we, we just can't, we can't do this. We're the ones that we always get stuck with the reports because the other police don't want to get involved. It's political, don't you know? And, um, and they said, you know, we'd like to work with you to change the whole system. So it's moved from the, the criminal law where nobody wants to deal with it to uh, uh, state civil infractions, the way traffic is handled, where you have a magistrate and they can adjust the punishment to the crime. Well, I think it's a great idea. It would certainly um, get elections out of competition with murders, sexual assaults, bank robberies, you know, um, so that we have somebody who actually cared about elections. But until we have law enforcement, we're going to have more and more corrupt elections. And, and just uh, it's, it's very disheartening. And I yeah. never did get I never did get a recount or anything else in 1980. And that's when I started working on all this. In California, we were supposed to um, start, to, we were supposed to depend on the county DA to, to support the election law, enforce the election law only. You, you, you look at it and you say, um, gee, the county DA is probably buddies with the county registrar of voters. And they're not going to want to go after the county. They're, county registers or voters. So we have a gap there. And this idea of the board of canvassers sounds like it would have been, would be, a, if it was actually carried out, uh, a much better independent organization to go to, to have things watched over. Wisconsin used to have that Karen McKim, if you uh, watched our interview from a couple of weeks ago, um, said that Wisconsin used to have an independent body. They did. They had a wonderful board that took care of things very well. To watch for over and that got gutted by yep. the Walker administration. It was one of the first things they took out. And I just saw a, a resignation by one of the Ethics Commission members that I think came out today because the Ethics Commission said, uh, took out the wording of wanting to have fair and honest elections. They took the wording out. And so it's, it's just degrading across the country. What, you've done legislative work. What has been your experience there? The Voting Rights Task Force here in California spends a lot of time in Sacramento. Uh, we probably have a better situation than many states. I know we do. But what about Michigan? What have you done? What have you tried to do? What's been your experience in, in, in working with the state capitol? Well, uh, from 2000 to 2010, uh, our legislature steadily deteriorated. Uh, one reason was that the voters had stupidly approved term limits. And uh, the result was that after six years, a candidate could not run again for the state house and after eight years for the state Senate. So we churned through uh, all of the experienced people who had been working on these issues and, and we'd had good relations with some of them. We'd actually gotten some bills introduced uh, that didn't go very far, but at least they got a hearing and committee uh, you know, election day registration. That was one we started with. We thought, well, this will this will be very popular. The clerks will like it. The voters will like it. It just simply gets rid of a, a level of bureaucracy we don't need to make people register a month before the election. We no longer have horses and buggies taking records <laughs> from one place to another. Um, and and we almost you know we almost got that advanced. Um, well, the sponsor for that bill was term limited. She left. Uh, nobody was left who knew anything or cared or even had an investment. The lobbyists started to run our state. Uh, the people who were left in the legislature after the 2010 uh, Tea Party takeover, I can describe them best as these are the Republican frat boys I would not date in college. They're daddy's boys. They're only there because they can't get a job anywhere else. Daddy bought them the election and uh, they're just there and they're going to go somewhere else afterward. And, you know, they're basically very stupid. Uh, they they've never had a decent education. They, they have more money than they know what to do with. Uh, they don't know how to be 
negotiators, politicians, crafters of the future. They don't know how to solve problems. In this state, our legislature has not figured out how to fund our road system. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's, uh, that's sick. You know, uh, roads are nonpartisan. Uh, everybody should be able to, to decide, okay, we need to have good roads. Otherwise, we can't get industry and we can't get jobs. People can't get to jobs. Uh, we don't have our roads being fixed. Nobody in the legislature wants to raise taxes on anything, and they've already given away the money they had to the Class C corporations for giant corporate tax cuts, which, by the way, hasn't helped our job situation at all, but we knew that. So our legislature is is really the dumbest bunch of people I've ever seen, and I've lived in Michigan since 1967. Um, they're just the bottom of the barrel. Uh, and we have a few shining lights that we've identified who, who are willing to work with us, and we... We keep trying. We keep trying to introduce bills. We've got two bills that we're going to try again in January, um, and and hopefully we can get some. We we actually have bipartisan sponsors because we have some shining lights who really care. Um, and you know, I don't know if the outcry over this recount is going to help us. Uh, the the legislators that we have from the Tea Party. They, they, they're beyond embarrassment. They don't seem to care that we're the laughing stock of the country. Uh, yeah, what you're describing, by the way, with the term limits is something we've seen in California. And we've seen yeah, committee chairs be rookies. Um, their, their first year, their first couple of months in office, they're running legislative committees. And I, I don't want to say they don't know what they're doing. I haven't seen any obvious failures, but you can't go back to the same people who have a history and a knowledge of, of whatever the topic is and, and be able to refer to something that happened five years ago because they weren't here. They, they don't have a clue. Five years ago. And that's something we've seen in California. They've recently extended the terms. Um so that it's not quite so bad. But I've heard now rumors that the Republican Party is going to try to establish term limits for Congress. Uh, that's just something, maybe a 20 year term limit or something would be reasonable, but not. It's going to take a constitutional amendment. I'm sorry that they're, they're out to lunch on that. So I'm hearing, I'm hearing rumors about this and Lord knows that they, they might do this. Do you have, uh, because we also on the Voting Rights Task Force spend a lot of Sacramento, a lot of time in Sacramento, do you have any other tips uh, on lobbying the Capitol about how to do it? Well, it's it really uh, takes a very concerted strategy. If you can get a bill introduced that's well written, and there's your big challenge, um, because we had a very detailed proposal for post election manual uh, audits of the vote uh, based on a risk limiting uh, model, a statistical model that would allow uh, everyone to agree that after the audit, it, the chance of a mistake was less than 5%, which is a pretty good confidence level. Um, so uh, getting that translated into actual legislate eve was, ease was very challenging because the people who work in the Legislative Service Bureau, and every state has one, that they're the people that write the bills for the legislators. These people are lawyers. They're not mathematicians. They're not statisticians. And, and they just didn't understand the concepts. So we had to go about four or five rounds to get the bill to actually say what our proposal said. Uh, we also had a lot of concepts from accounting and auditing that they were not familiar with. For example, an auditor has to be independent of the system that they're auditing. A bank examiner comes in and, and examines the bank from a completely different agency. And, and we kept saying, no, uh, these audits are not going to be done by people from the Secretary of State. Uh, that would be the fox, you know, auditing the hen house. So uh, it took a long time to get these principles through. And by the way, the principles for good uh, post-election audits are well articulated in a document on electionaudits.org. I was part of the group that wrote those. It took a, about a year for uh, a lot of us to put that together. 
and um, and uh, post election audits. Any bill should should uh, meet those standards, or it's it's not going to work. Um, and and that's the problem. You have to write legislation that's very clear, uh, that's very detailed. You can't leave anything up to to <laughs> guesswork. Um, and the early uh, writers in our state were very good at this. They did not leave anything to imagination. Uh, but lately, these these uh, term limited legislators don't want to put in the work to do that, and they will just say, "Make it so," and they expect you know their their um, uh, starship people to figure it out, uh, and and they end up with messes. Uh, right now, we're going through what we call the shame duck legislature. Uh, it's after the election, and they start getting really crazy, and they'll introduce twelve bills an hour, and these bills are mostly from ALEC, and they're badly written, and they don't fit anything else in the system of the state, and, and nobody seems to care. And as a result, a lot of these bills get thrown out. I mean, it's, they're, it's, it's, it's like kindergarten. It's terrible. So once you have a really good bill that's very well uh, written, that's very clear, uh, and that's a skill, then you have to get a, a, a committee to have a hearing on it. Um, that's a, a real stretch because if the committee chair doesn't like your bill, you're never going to see the light of day. So we've had to cultivate the committee chair, um, who is, she's a Tea Partier, um, very, very much obedient to the Tea Party uh, hierarchy. They, she won't do anything they, they won't tell her to do. And so we've had to figure out how to appeal to things that, that she cares about. Um, you know, the whole idea of us voting on machines made by foreign countries, uh, their software that we can't even see. Um, that actually did appeal to her to stop that, <laughs> to, to take control over, over who counts our votes. Um, so sometimes we, we can find common ground and that's the struggle right now is how do you find common ground with people who, who fundamentally really don't believe in democracy? Finding common ground. We're talking with Jen Bendor of the Michigan Election Reform Alliance, right.org. Uh, and we've been covering a lot of things about the recounts and the history of elections in Michigan. We just have had um, another colleague of mine step in who was last week also in Michigan, Carl Carter. <laughs> You were out there from the Voting Rights Task Force. Say hi to Jen. Hi, Jen. Carl. Good to see you again. Yeah, thank you. Likewise. Carl, tell us what you saw or didn't see. Uh, well, it was uh, it was an eye-opening experience. Um, my background is I'm a tax accountant, so I look at things from somewhat of an accounting background. Um, I'm not really an auditor. I've had many other hats in my life. But... Um, when we first uh, were looking at our first group of ballots, the, uh, the, uh, the staff were very diligent in counting uh, 401 ballots and uh, they counted 401 twice. The tape for the election uh, precinct said 402. So uh, we were looking to try to figure out how to reconcile this and uh, we did find that there was a single damaged or spoiled ballot in a separate envelope, which um, would have been by uh, proper procedures duplicated and put in the pile of the 400 and one. Um, as it turned out, we'd had four people looking at these 401 ballots. No one noticed that there was any duplicate ballot in there. So if one was an auditor, one would say, oh, well, here's someone didn't make the duplicate. We could easily see that. Um, we can probably read the intent on the original ballot, and you could either put that into the appropriate Trump or Clinton or, or Stein column when you're actually counting individual ballots. Um, but the way the state, uh, a corporate attorney, interpreted the state regulations is because the number did not match and the canvassers were not willing to look again at the 401 ballots, these 401 were thrown out. They would not be recounted. Uh, we encountered that same situation later on the second day, uh, 
and we actually were able to count two precincts that had um, matched the tape. So we felt positive about that. We counted probably close to 2,000 ballots in three precincts. And uh, I don't think there was a change on any of the outcome of those, of those two precincts. We were allowed to count the actual votes for party. We did notice that there were some uh, significant uh, blank ballots that were troubling to me as we went through this because uh, some of these precincts were the absentee ballots and it seemed very unusual that people would trouble to return a ballot, sign the envelope and not mark a single uh, election or proposition or judge or anyone down ballot. If there was none of the above for the presidency, we could almost understand that. There were a few people who actually wrote none of the above, which spoils the ballot for the presidential, but it, it doesn't spoil the rest of the ballot. So um, I think Detroit has 900 and some odd precincts. Jan, you can help me with that. But um, there would have been 900 separate precinct counts and then also 900 separate absentee ballot counts. So there's roughly 1,800 uh, separate counts that would have gone on just for the uh, city of Detroit, not even all of Wayne County, I think. Uh, so if you have two or three, or in one case, we found six perfectly blank ballots tucked into that, um, if you've got 1,800 times four or five, you know, that comes up to close to eight or 9,000 ballots right there that are for some reason returned blank. Now, if well, I and, well, and you don't know, no. you don't know if they were actually returned by that's that voter. That is absolutely correct. And I, I wish I paid more attention to the AV ballots to see whether or not those blank ballots had any folding marks or whether they were pristine ballots out of a package and that that would have been telling but you know i i, I wasn't quite uh on top of my game i guess just to pay attention to everything we were um I, on another count we had three precincts in one bag that we were given and we uh, counted the first batch and we neither matched the machine count nor the book count. And the book count was, I think, three lower than the machine count. And I think we were, I forget whether we were one off from the machine count, but in any case, uh, no, we were two ballots. That was it, it was, it was precinct six. We were two ballots short. So the, uh, uh, the what do you call them? The, the employee came around and said, well, why don't you put those aside? We will see if the other ballots uh, come up and the other two, because they're all mixed together in the same bag. So we proceeded to count the next precinct and we got exactly 721 ballots, which was the tape amount. So that was fine. And then we went through and counted them um, by uh, uh, as a candidate. And we got, I think, one less for Hillary and one more for Trump. So we had 314 in that one and 289 for, for Hitton. Hillary. So we had set that aside and then people decided to go to lunch, which, you know, was about 12, 30, quarter one. And uh, that was apparently a no, no, even though it's a secure room and everything should be secure in there. And there are staff wandering around all the time. Um, a one of the 51 Trump attorneys came around and challenged the fact that these ballots were not secure, even though they had been set aside by the uh, the employees from the county and told us what to do, where to leave them, et cetera. They had 51 attorneys? Yeah, we had one attorney representing the Green Party and 51, it was kind of like, um, well, 51 Trump, attorneys. 51 Trump attorneys wandering around the room looking for anything that they could possibly uh, put their finger on, create a problem, stop the recount. So mm -hmm. we, uh, we had come back from lunch and so they had put a challenge in not for the one precinct that was left in the bag that was open. I, I agree, there could be an issue of chain of custody there that was not totally out of line, but 
the fact that you've got all these employees around there that was certainly questionable, but they decided to challenge not the one in the bag, but all three precincts that had been in the bag. So, okay, so they, they make their challenge and then we decide to continue counting. Okay, you've made your challenge, we wanna finish the job. So we counted the third, because we were still looking for those two ballots that were missing from the first group that we counted that we were short. So we counted the third group after the uh, challenge and we found that it was exactly correct. It was 421 and we found 421 and we tied to the tape. And so we then divided them into candidates and there was no change. There was no change in the final outcome of the 421. So <laughs> then the, uh, the three, three attorneys who were at our table decided to put their heads together and said, well, we'll drop the challenge. Well, Trump just picked up two ballots. Of course they want to drop the challenge. You know, there's no consistency among them. They just thought if we can win something here, we'll pick it up. What we later found out was this satchel actually it had six or seven precincts in it. And the other three or four were on a table next to us where the people had counted all the ballots. We never knew that they had ballots out of our satchel. We never had any interaction to find out if they found two ballots from our precinct, which then would have tied in, um, and whether or not they had a miscount because they didn't check that it was precinct six, precinct six within seven or nine or whatever they were working on. So um, that was a bit frustrating. And uh, I just gave you an example of the minutia plus the 51 attorneys wandering around trying to create whatever havoc they could. So. It made and, it very hard I, to prove. Jeff? I, I, I would like, I would to, like to chime, chime in, in that uh, the bullying and uh, other bad behavior by the Trump uh, volunteers and lawyers uh, was noted in many other uh, recount locations. In Washtenaw County, the Trump people announced right up front that they were going to challenge everything that their goal was to take up all the time and and make the recount impossible to conduct. Right. Fortunately, uh, yeah. the people who were running that site uh, deftly handled them and said, we will continue with all recount uh, activities. You can file challenges, uh, but they will not be, uh, while we are conducting the recount, you'll have to do those on as we as we proceed. Um, they, they were running out the clock and running out the clock is fine in football, but it is not okay in a democratic procedure. Yep, exactly. exactly. Okay, Jan, speaking of the clock, we're starting to run out. <laughs> uh, I will leave a, with a couple of questions and, and a couple of notes. One, we're talking with Jan Bendor of election, a Michigan election Reform Alliance. Alliance. Mm -hmm. dot org. Mm -hmm. uh, please go to her site, and you have a Facebook page too, I think. Yes, we do. Uh, you can find them in Facebook and, and give them all the support you can, because obviously she's doing a fabulous job, and, and her people are doing a fabulous job, and we need more support for this work because it's going to be across fifty states each state at a time, and with some luck, occasion, we'll make progress in Washington. We also, I should note, Jan mentioned risk-limiting audits, which is the brainchild of Dr. Philip Stark. We interviewed Dr. Stark back in late September. You can find the, um, the interview on Balance for Bernie or Richard. What's the name of the YouTube page? Um. California Election Integrity Coalition. YouTube page, California Election Integrity Coalition, where you can find our weekly interviews on YouTube. And including this one. Including, you'll find this one there. It will uh, be this is, on YouTube. This will be on, on YouTube uh, in, a in, day or so. yeah. in, a, in a couple of days. And there's an excellent collection of those. These are, in a sense, an extension of the conference that Ballots for Bernie and the Voting Rights Task Force. We held a national conference in Richmond in October, and it was very good. I'm sorry we didn't get you out here, but next time we will do that, because you are obviously one of the guiding lights of the election integrity 
movement. Um, one, what would you like to see happen in the future? What are your priorities? Well, we have priorities for our state, certainly, that are important to those in our organization. And uh, we, we definitely like to see our state make uh, a rational decision, not a politically driven decision about how we count our votes in the future. Uh, one of the things that we included in our 2014 report on facing the election cliff uh, was an appeal for a blue ribbon commission to sit down for two years and, and figure this out with massive public input. And we actually now have a bill for that to happen. Unfortunately, our secretary of state uh, has not taken our input on this, and they are rolling forward to go out and buy the same old, same old again. Uh, the good news is they don't have the money, uh, the $65 million it would cost them. So we're happy that that's holding up what would be a very bad investment. And we've done the math to show that if you actually uh, took that same money, which is only going to buy you uh, machines for, that will last for eight years, and the warranties will only go that long. If you took $65 million and you used it uh, to train and pay very, you know, very highly qualified people to hand count votes on election night, they come in fresh around 10 o'clock, and they actually do the counting uh, in a public process uh, where anyone can observe and, and witness it. Um, and, and they will follow a procedure that's been established as highly accurate and reliable. And they come from an outside force. Again, they're counting the votes uh, as auditors would. And uh, we would employ about 20,000 Michigan residents in every election. And we keep the money in the state. It's a jobs program. Yeah. Um, and this would, the $65 million would last for 40 years. Um, that's the bottom line of how we spend our money on elections. Now, uh, we thought um, some of our conservative uh, uh, people would like that idea. I mean, we have uh, conservatives on our our Mira board. We've tried to be multipartisan. We have we have uh, libertarians. We have Greens, and so we were trying to appeal to everybody's value system with that argument. Uh, but the problem is there are people who are very tied to these companies, and they stand to get rewards from contracting with them. That's what happened in two thousand and three, and we know how that went down.